The younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of the estate that falls to me. So he divided his wealth between them. And not many days later, the younger son gathered everything together and went on a journey into a distant country. And there he squandered his estate with loose living. Now when he had spent everything, a severe famine occurred in that country, and he began, uh, he began to be impoverished. So he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country, and he sent him into his fields to feed swine. And he would have gladly filled his stomach with the pods that the swine were eating, and no one was giving anything to him. Thank you, Kevin. Well, happy Father's Day to some of you. Uh, it's always a great time for family and a great time to remember fathers and, and all those relationships that we have. Uh, lots of great things are going on. Uh, Wednesday singing is happening, Ashby's class, so we're having singing and uh, classes there. We're having the meal on Wednesday night, so there's lots of great things going on. And besides that, you get to go out for Father's Day. Or you get to cook for Father's Day. At least you're gonna get to eat for Father's Day, so that's always a good thing. Uh, we wanna talk a little bit about God as our Father. We've been, we've been trying to describe what it means to be open. To open to Jesus, open to God. And now open to this concept of father. You don't see it real early in the Old Testament. But definitely in the New Testament, he talks very much about this idea of Jesus. And he calls God father. And he seems to introduce this and refer to this almost exclusively in his relationship with God. That God is father. And so that's what he talks about. And that's what he wants us to know. I think sometimes we try to get rid of God. He's in the way, he makes rules we don't like, and we'd rather go do stuff that he tells us not to, and so we don't want a God like that, and so we would rather pretend he doesn't exist. Uh, but we might need his resources, and so if we could just get his money, then we would be on our own and we would be just great. Wouldn't that be wonderful? Uh, this story doesn't let us see that it always turns out that way. And so this story talks about who the father is, and it really talks about who the son is as well. And so it says a man had two sons. The younger one, as we've just described, says, I want my inheritance now. He's ready for that now. And uh, the father divides it between them. He does not just give it to the younger son. He gives it to both sons. And so it's already split up, it's already divided, he's taking care of it all. They already know exactly who's going to get what. It was all a plan, the younger son leaves, and he decides he's going to spend it however he wants to spend it. And so he has parties all the time, he is in reckless living, I'll just leave you to your imagination. I don't think our Bible terms here even come close to describing what this guy was doing. And maybe in our day, well, we could describe what the party life is like or what that would be. Notice that it's the son that leaves. It's never the father that leaves. So the father did not go anywhere. The father stayed right where he was. God is never going to leave you. It's always our choice to leave God. And so he decides, I want to go have fun. I want to go do what I want to do. And so he does go and he does leave. And as soon as he's spent it all, there's a famine that comes. There's not enough crops. There's not enough jobs. And so there's not enough money to go around. He doesn't have any more. And so now what does he do? And the best he can do is get a job feeding pigs something never allowed back in his home country. It always makes me wonder, how did the famine come? Did God bring the famine? Do you ever wonder those things? Did, is some of the things that happen that gets in the way that prevents us from just doing whatever we wanted, is it somebody up there saying, you can't do that? 
Have you ever thought about that before? Or maybe you guys all get away with it. I don't know. But it doesn't seem to work that way for a lot of the rest of us. It seems like every time we decide, okay, we're going to ignore God. We're going to go do what we want. And this is going to work perfect. It never works perfect. It never even comes close. And there are always things that get in the way. But then if you look at life, really, those things get in the way of everybody. And maybe we just need God all the time anyway. And it isn't that anybody was out to get us. It's that that's just the nature of this life. It's really not to be lived on the pleasure level. As if we could always do all the things that we want and never do anything we don't want. That's not really living. That's not really the life that we have. And so when we think about that sometimes and think about what God is doing with us, I'm not sure it's always bad luck. When we do go against God, there will be consequences for every choice that you make about your life. And whether it's a matter of God enforcing the consequences and making those happen, sometimes it's just a matter of the fact that this is the life you chose. And you spent 20 years at it or 10 years at it, and it, it leaves you with empty years where you didn't accomplish things that you might have wanted to. And it doesn't leave you in the same place as other people. This, it's always interesting to watch that dynamic and watch how it works. We lived in Miami for a while. South Beach, right? Everybody knows party capital of the world. And sure enough, there were a lot of them. And so when you get to be 21, you can sleep all day, get up about 11, go out to the club by one, party till five, and then you come back and say, oh, I got to go to work. Nah, I'm not going to work today. I don't feel good today. And so you go back and you sleep till you have to get up and you go out and do the same thing. Night after night. That's why South Beach exists. That's why all the clubs, they, they do great because they are exactly preying on the same kind of people that we're talking about today. And when you do that for 10 years and you wake up and say, wait a minute, why don't I have an education? Well, <laughs> I think you kind of skipped that part. Why don't I have a career? Well, I think you might have skipped that part. Well, why aren't I getting uh, so much further along in life? Why don't I have money like these other people have money who have jobs? Well, I think you skipped that part. It's not a punishment of God. It's just a natural consequence. I mean, realize the things that you do are going to lead there. And so whether this can be seen as God going after this guy or God not going after this guy, I think he's going to end up in the same place anyway, isn't he? It gets to be our own natural consequences and what we kind of ask for. And so this is a very familiar story. It's so familiar, in fact, that we do not even recognize it when it shows up in our own life. And it's one of those things that we just skip over. The next section talks about the man when he decides, I've got to do something about this because I don't like where I am. So when he came to himself, he said, how many of my father's hired servants have more than enough bread? And I perish here with hunger. I will rise and go to my father and I will say to him, father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me as one of your hired servants. And he rose and he came to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and felt compassion and ran and embraced and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. And the father said to the servant, Quickly bring the best robe and put it on him and bring the ring in his hand and the shoes on his feet and bring the fatted calf and kill it and let us eat and celebrate. For this my son was dead. He was lost and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to celebrate. So it says when he came to himself, when he first woke up, when he first looked around, when he first saw that his bank account was empty, did he not notice that before? 
Did he not watch the trend? Did he not see how this whole thing is going? You know, sometimes you just want to live for now, don't you? And you just get so tired of being responsible, you'd like to just take some time to be irresponsible. And just go do whatever you wanted to do. And there will be consequences. And you will pay for it. And this guy does, because apparently he didn't notice. He didn't realize, and so who could plan for a famine anyway? And so he never thought of that. He comes to this decision when he says, you know what, I'm a servant, and I've known other servants. I don't think he's ever been in need before. He's always been the son up in the big house. You know how all that works in the farm community, where you're the big house up on the hill, and all of everybody else is the workers out in the field or something like that. And now... He's the worker, except for it's pigs. He really doesn't like pigs, and so he says, I'm going to make a decision. I'm going to go back to my father. That is a huge decision because he's going back to a person he has insulted. He's going to back to a person he has taken for granted, and he has lost everything that man ever worked for. And when you begin to look at that and you begin to realize that that's what he's going back to, he's going back to repent and going back to say, I'm sorry. He took what was his and now he has nothing to show for it. And so he goes back and his decision is to confess his sin and to say, can you make me a servant? Well, he already is a servant. I mean, it's not really asking for anything any different. He just says, I know your servants are better. I'm not asking for you to make me a servant. I want to be one of your servants because you treat your servants better than anybody else. And sometimes that's where we get to is we're trying to say, you know what? I, I just want to be around somebody who treats me better. There's no way I'm ever going to get ahead but if you can allow me to be a hired servant. And so he arises and he goes to his father. And his father sees him coming and he runs and there is all of this compassion. And he runs and he embraces and he kisses and he waits. Because that's as far as it goes. What's the son going to say? He wants him to know he's accepted, but he also wants him to know that, you know what, you left. And now what? And sure enough, the son knows exactly, and he tells him exactly what he was going to say. I have sinned against heaven and against you. He's open about his mistakes. He's open about what he's done. And he is, obviously, there's no money left. There's nothing left. And so the mistake is kind of glaring and... He says, I'm unworthy to be a son. And he confesses his shame. I am unworthy. And the father says, I am not going to leave you as unworthy. In fact, I'm not even going to leave you as a servant. And so because of his openness to the father, because of his openness about his own sin, he says, I want you to get the fatted calf. Let's kill it. It's time to eat. It's time to celebrate. Get the ring. Put it on his finger. We, my son was dead, and now he's alive. He was lost, and now he's found. And so he makes him back into son again. What an incredible thing. Not servant, but son again. I'm not sure it's possible for him to be servant there. Because God does not accept us as servants. And we may want to just, you know, get in the door. I still don't want to follow any of your rules. Just make me a servant. And I think God would say, no. You're either going to come back and be my son, or you get to stay with the pigs. Because I will not have you back as just another servant. There's one opening I have, and that opening is for a son. Do you want it? And he does. 
It's more than he could ever think of. It's more than he could ever ask for because now his father has accepted him back and he has all of these things and how great that is. But now he has to follow the rules. But I don't think he minds the rules as much. There is no more inheritance. He spent it all. He doesn't get any more. But he does get to be son in the father's house. Eventually going to be the big brother's house. But that's another story. We will do that one later sometime. So the parable is about relationships with God. It's about how we are open. We're open about what we want. We're open about what we're going to do. We're open about everything. We're open about our attitude, whether it's good or whether it's bad. We're open about what we have done. We're open to God about our failure. We're open to God because he loves and forgives and accepts. And he expects when we repent. He is as open as can be. And that's what he's looking for. The son who comes back, not just to say, well, I ran out of money, so you got any more? He does not have any more money for that lifestyle. But he has a place for a son. And that's like all the rest of us when we've made mistakes and God says, I have a place for a child. And you can be a child of God. I don't have a place for somebody who's going to take all the blessings I've got and then go back into the same kind of life again. I don't have place for that. But I have place for someone who's willing to repent and be open with me and come back and be my child. And God does have place for that. And so that's the first one. We're open to the things that... We're open about our own self, and we're open about our own mistakes and our own sin. But I think there's another part to this whole story that we need to be open to God. Because mistakes is not your whole life. Mistakes is what happened in the past. Mistakes are something you get through and you get past, and now what? And I think a lot of times we start thinking about God as if, you know what, it's all about in the past but how do I live life now what does that mean and so we seem not to know what to do with that once you've repented you've come to God then you're now what we seem to struggle with that part so let's go back a little bit more to the beginning when Jesus was 12 they find him in the temple they had gone for Passover, and Jesus had stayed, and uh, the parents were going back home. They thought he was with some of the other friends, and he's not there, and they can't find him for three days. My mama would be upset. <laughs> <laughs> and she comes and asks, why are you doing this to us? And here's his answer. He said to them, why were you looking for me? Did you not know that I must be in my father's house? Would she have known that? Could she have known that? Is there something about this 12-year-old boy that would say, why didn't you look in the temple first? I mean, that's been my whole hope. And you can usually tell what your other kids are interested in and what they want and all of those kinds of things, can't you? You know, the action figures that they have and the way they jump around and hack and kick at things. You can tell, okay, I think they're into this now. It's either a soccer ball or a person. I mean, maybe it's sports or maybe it's karate or maybe it, you know, but they all do that. And so he's saying, didn't you know who I am? And from the time he is this young, he says, that's where I belong is in my father's house. Interesting contrast, isn't it, to prodigal son? I don't want to be in my father's house, but Jesus says, I do want to be in my father's house. Why wouldn't you look for there? What do you think I am, prodigal? Not at all. That's where you would look for me. And how amazing that is. And we see that. 
translation may be a little bit difficult. Some say, in my father's business, about my father's affairs. It's kind of the in my father's stuff, in all the things that he's doing. Isn't it great when kids want to help? Do you remember those days? Kids want to help and do things. Here's Jesus as he sits among the scribes and he's talking to them about all the things that are going on and he's asking questions and he's answering questions. He says, that's my people. That's where I belong. You remember the times when they wanted to help? We're going to go. We're going to help. And as soon as you said, we want to, I'm going to go out and rake the leaves. I want to rake leaves. You bet. That's great, isn't it? Of course, you realize it's going to take you three times as long because, after all, they're going to help. I want to wash the car. I've got to go wash the car. I'll help you wash the car. All right, so we're going to go out. We're going to wash the car, and they've got soap all over the place where you just rinsed, and now you're going to have to do it again. And, but they want to help, so you want to help this go better, right? Always great. You remember those times when you helped your dad? When he did all this kind of stuff, it was always amazing. I can remember when I was young, my father had an electric motor winding shop. None of you guys had as cool a toys as I had. It was right across the street from the house, so you could go over there, and there was all kinds of things that you didn't know the name of. And they would spin, and they were iron and metal and all this stuff. And you could, he, he literally took the wiring out of generators, reround the coils, put the coils back in. I know, this is a long time ago. <laughs> anyway, that was kind of his business. And so I could help him with this. I could help do all this stuff. And, and at least, it was more play than help, I think. But... Uh, you know, I would say I'm going to help, and so it all went great. We did all kinds of things. The one thing about this picture, though, is the dad is there and the son is there, and while both of them are there working, it works great. And the dad goes inside and gets a phone call, and the son's out there left by himself. He's going... Where's the help? <laughs> I was helping dad. Does it work to say this to the son? Let's go out and wash the car. You start. I'll be there later. Would that work? No. No, we work together. And as soon as it's not us working together, then I don't want to do this anymore. And so I quit. I, I don't want to do this. This isn't right. This isn't good. I don't want to do this. I want us to do this together. And, and so I think we see it that way and we realize it's that way. Even if it's washing dishes or whatever it is, I want us to do this. Because as soon as dad walks off and goes, okay, you can just go ahead and finish. I don't want to do this. And I think this is the basic core of where we end up. We do not see God working with us. We started there. We're going to do great things for God. And it's God and me. And, and God and me are doing these things. And it's, it's we are just out here able to do great things until one day... We think God went home. And somehow, he said, I want you to do this. And no, I'll do it with you. You stay here with me. We do with me. And, and we kind of lost it all. We did all kinds of things. My dad would make pipe cleaner, man. We made stilts. You walk around on stilts, that's great fun, right? That's when you've got nothing else. You can nail a block of wood on a board and say, okay, this is a stilt, son, go have fun, great. It was great fun, maybe to get me out of his hair, but uh, it's just, watch me, Dad, watch me. 
And as long as we can do the watch me or feel like he's there with us working, then, okay, we're willing to do any amount of work, whatever. It's always that way, isn't it? That's true with my grandson, true it as well. I mean, it was great. As soon as you'd say, I'm going to vacuum the floor. I want to vacuum the floor. Well, he's got to have his little, I want to mow the lawn. I'm going to mow the lawn. It worked great until the day when they were trying to explain that you're going to have a little sister. I'm going to have a little sister. Uh, no, you're not. Not this time. <laughs> that part's not going to help. But we see this all the way through in the way that we do this. And if you look at the life of Jesus, he talks about this. And this is a concept we really need to get to be open to the Father. Because when Jesus is baptized, we see him there and the Holy Spirit descends and God speaks from heaven. This is my beloved son. I'm pleased with you. He's watching you walk on this. God is always there with him. When Jesus is tempted, you notice the answers that he gives. The answers that he gives is, don't put God to the test. Only listen to the word of God. I live by his word, not by any bread. And I listen only to God and serve him. And I will not put him in that place. There's a time when Jesus heals a man at a pool of Bethesda in John 5. He's laying there and he doesn't have anyone to put him out into the water. And the story goes, the angel comes and troubles the water. And if you could drop a lame man in, theoretically, he's going to be healed and he can swim out. That's a lot of faith, right? Because if you drop a lame man and he's not healed, that's a lot of faith, right? But that's what he believes, and so he's laying there. He has no one to be able to put him into the water. And so Jesus comes, and he says, well, do you want to be healed? Well, of course I want to be healed. Then get up your bed and go home. And he does. And it's amazing, and it's wonderful. And they come and ask, well, who did this? And he says, I don't know. And then finally, Jesus comes back to him. And he talks to him. And it's such an amazing story of a complete hopeless person who's encountered Jesus. And he's been able to come to this place. And afterward, Jesus found him in the temple and he said to him, See, you are well. Sin no more that nothing worse may happen to you. And the man went away and he told the Jews that it was Jesus who had healed him. And this was why the Jews were persecuting Jesus, because he was doing these things on the Sabbath. But Jesus answered them, my father is working until now, and I am working. Interesting, right? I mean, if you get the context of what all is going on, Jesus has healed this man at the pool of Bethesda, but it was on Sabbath day. What does Sabbath mean? Sabbath day means you're not supposed to work, right? That was the concept. Now, can you tell a man to get up and pick up his bed and go home? You didn't touch him. You didn't do it. And he does. And so, therefore, I'm not sure it qualifies at work, but they think it qualifies as work. And so they're saying, well, this isn't right. And Jesus comes back with, on Sabbath day, I am working and my father is working. Oh, that's not good. What are you doing saying God works on Sabbath? What are you doing here with my father is working until now and I am working? Wow. Jesus says, you know, I'm the kid washing the car. And what I see God doing is what I am doing. And if a man needs to be healed on a Sabbath day, then... I see God healing him. And Jesus claims this is exactly what he's doing. As you look a little bit further down in the chapter, same, same chapter, same setting. So Jesus said to them, truly, I say to you, the son can do nothing that is his own accord, but only what he sees the father doing. 
For whatever the Father does, the Son does likewise. For the Father loves the Son and shows him all the things he himself is doing. And greater works than these will he show him so that you may marvel. And so Jesus says, I, I, I'm the kid washing the car. I do exactly what the Father's doing. It's what he said. And it's present tense. I am doing that now. I am following God now. I see him responding to people now. And when I en encounter a man who needs to be healed, who has this kind of faith, who's laying by a pool, who would not survive the fall without the miracle of God, I'm going to ask, do you want to get up? Do you want to be healed? And then he says, I'm going to say, pick up your bed and go home. He does not pick up his bed for him. Make sure you realize this. He is not saying to the man, oh, you poor man, how terrible, how awful. In fact, he seems to be saying to the man, I think you're a sinner. Don't do this kind of sin that got you to this place anymore. But you can come to a father then, and I want you to be healed. What he sees his father doing may not be a literal my father is right there and my father is healing the man but I see this is what my father would do in this situation there's not a specific time like that and so what do we see the father do well he sees this great compassion he sees this great loving kindness he sees people with needs and so he says to him pick up your bed and go home and he does and you see them working together like this he comes to John 14 when Jesus is trying to explain he is going back to the father Philip said to him Lord show us the father it is enough for us and Jesus said to him have I been with you so long that you still do not know me Philip Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father in me? The words that I say to you, I do not speak on my own authority, but the Father who dwells in me does his work. Believe me that I am in the Father and the Father's in me, or else believe on account of the works themselves. Truly, I say to you, whoever believes in me will also do works that I do, and greater works than these he will do, because I am going to the Father. And whatever you ask in my name, this I will do, and the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask me anything in my name, I will do it. And they've been there with Jesus, and they've seen Jesus, and they've watched Jesus, and they've done exactly what Jesus was doing. He was on the other side of the car washing that, and we're on this side of the car, and we're doing it with him. We're working with him. We are disciples with him as we teach and as we heal and as we cast out demons, and they saw themselves as being absolutely with Jesus in his ministry until he dies on a cross. As soon as he dies on a cross, they say, we're going fishing. We don't think he's coming back. Because we no longer see him here working with us. And the one concept that Jesus teaches in all of his activity is God at work. There is a father who works. It is never a concept of God just sitting up in heaven doing nothing. He says, I am the son, I have come here. The words that I speak are the father's words. The actions that I do are God working through me. The things that you do are the fact that I am working through you and God is going to be doing greater things than this because it's going to be working through me. If we have a concept of a God who does not work and just sits in heaven, we have lost it. The one thing he teaches about a father is a father works. He does. And that's got to be our concept of God. Because he is working with us now as God is working. And so Jesus comes back with whatever you ask in my name. I will do that the son may be glorified in the Father, because 
we are all in this process together. And it's what he tried to say. My father is working. I am working. I'm bringing you into this whole thing that God is alive, that God is working. This is what we do. This is how it all functions. And yet sometimes I think we feel like God left us alone with our ministry and the fact that, okay, now I'm here all by myself doing this. And you're not. Don't just sit down after you pray. Because if you're ever going to pray for God to do something, he's expecting you to be part of the process of here's how it works. Here's what we do because the Father is still working. And so Jesus shows us this picture of a working Father. And he says, be like your Father. What do you see him doing in your life? What do you see him doing around you? That would be the thing to do. And so we see both of those pictures in an incredible way. No matter how many steps you have taken away from God, it still only takes one step to get back. And that's really what happens. Open to God is first about our sin, about our mistakes, about our failures. But that's not enough. Open to God is also about His work. And what we see him doing, how he is working. Can you see him working through you? Can you see that he has made you a son? Can you see that he wants to bring you back? Today, if you're not able to do this, if you haven't accomplished this, if you feel like, well, he's not really my father, if you feel like he's not really part, then let's make him part of your father, that he is your father today. Because that's the two things he wants. If you'll be open to him about your sin and open to him about his work, what a great thing it is to be able to see this is my father and how he works among us. Would you come while we stand and sing?